So before I get into today's episode, um, I have some important information that I'd like to share that will ultimately affect the way I approach this episode. So I would like to refer you to an article I posted on my blog recently titled Ditching Beck Me for od and So basically, I'm just going to go through this article and impart this information. Recently, I have somewhat come to realize, and I'm just, I'm literally reading off the article here. I have come to realize that I could do more with the world of Mistara if I wasn't using Beck me D&D as the core rule set. I realize that this is pretty controversial, but I will try to defend my case here. So if you've been following my YouTube channel, Solo Dungeon Crawler, then you may have engaged with my Castle of the Quest videos. In that series, I'm playing od and and quite frankly, the more I have come to understand this simple yet complex set of rules, the more I have come to appreciate its brilliance. When I first started doing YouTube videos about playing Dungeons & Dragons solo, I made a point of recommending the Beck Me rules as one of the better places to start a solo adventuring journey. So has this changed? Well, yes and no. In my first blog article in this series, How to Play D&D Solo, which was somewhat a write-up of the YouTube series of the same name, with some corrections made, I recommended specifically Basic D&D, and I went on to describe its various versions, which included the Holmes rules, the Moldvay rules, and finally the Mensa rules, which evolved into Beckme through its various box sets, which were eventually compiled into the rules cyclopedia. I specifically pointed to the Mensa rules as the best place to start for the following reasons. Reason number one, it was the final iteration of the basic D&D rules. Reason number two, the purpose of basic D&D was to make the game even easier to learn than its predecessors, i.e. or D&D. Reason number three, D&D solo adventures were actually published for use with the Frank Mensa Dungeons & Dragons rules, which are a great resource for getting a taste for solo gaming. And reason number four, one of the main tools I intended to use for solo gaming, Gary Gygax's Solo Dungeon Adventures article, published in Strategic Review Issue 1, was created for the original game, and as I explained in the original article, the original game and basic D&D are very closely related. So to summarize this argument, I chose the Beckme Red Box for Solo D&D because it was an easy to learn evolution of OD&D with a few solo adventure modules written for it. And my main solo gaming tool that I was building my solo gaming approach around, the Solo Dungeon Adventures article, was written for od and and would work well enough with the Beckme Red Box basic set. So to further conceptualize my argument, Beckme was chosen because it was easier to learn than od and But what about the known world or Mistara, the official campaign setting for Beckme, which I have set my podcast in? Personally, I think od and can do it justice with a little twist. Not too long ago, I came across a post on the Piazza forum entitled More OKW Documents, which had links to some scanned pages. The poster explained in January of 2022, Bill Wilkerson, a player in Tom Moldvay's and Lawrence Schick's original Known World, OKW campaign 
circa 1976 to 1979, graciously met with me at a copy shop in Akron this morning and we scanned the contents of his accordion folder. These articles contain OD&D house rules, character sheets, campaign prep notes and even an adventure called the Quest for the Sacred Scepter. And um, there is a link to the original article on my blog. These documents might prove monumental in my quest to integrate the gnome world, aka Mastara, into an od and campaign. And don't forget this is originally where the setting started in the first place. This doesn't mean I'm going to alter the timeline or revert setting information back to how it was between 1976 and 1979. These documents are just useful reference for integrating the setting into the rules, or more precisely, if a situation comes up where for whatever reason the od and rules as written don't cover it, then these documents may help me make a ruling. So the main reason I have decided to do this is, as I said at the start of the article, I believe I can do more with Mistara if I use od and rules and my reasons for this are as follows. Number one, od and is a much more emergent rule set in the sense that just by playing it as instructed, the referee creates and evolves the world. I find this to be less true with Beckme. I don't want the world necessarily to feel static. I want to build upon what is there. For example, a wilderness adventure in od and is much more likely to result in new monster lairs being present, which could lead to new important locations that have some influence on the world. So reason number two is the rules are simpler, allowing the campaign to change state faster and an emergent story to flow. Reason number three, there is still so much to discover about od and that has been largely forgotten by today's standards. Using these rules in a well-known campaign setting with various popular adventure modules will be a great thought exercise which may uncover some hidden truths that I previously didn't notice. And the fourth and final reason, the more I play od and the more fun I find it. I absolutely love it. Doing this will help me show you why I love it. And I could probably sit here and think of more reasons and many will come up throughout my actual play, I'm sure. But I'll let my reasoning rest there for now and just get ready to implement this new approach. So prepare yourself that in this episode of Tales of Mistara, the Palace of Evander, a conversion will take place. And the first thing that I will mention regarding that conversion is that I've drawn up the section of the campaign map that I will be using in today's session and the reason I have done that is because I have the hexes numbered down the left hand side and alphabetized across the top and this is so that I can utilize a map key and in od and one of the unique things about it is that if you uncover the lair of a monster or um, through various forms of emergent play new locations are added to the map such as baronies and strongholds then I can add these to the map key and I can uh, note the coordinates down of the location of that particular place of interest. There are some differences in regards to the adventuring parties. Now I have converted to od and rules. Here are just a few things to keep in mind. Under the od and encumbrance rules, Ilyena, Yolanda and Cathbad's party are currently moving at 180 feet per turn as opposed to 60 feet per turn. 
This is due to the encumbrance rules being slightly different and in OD&D characters make two moves in every 10 minute turn instead of just one move. Claudius's party is also moving at 180 feet per turn. I have also changed the hex scale of the wilderness maps to 5 miles per hex instead of 8. This is because OD&D only really deals with 5 or 1 mile hexes. A figure on foot travels 15 miles per day, easily divisible by 3 into 5 mile hexes, and a third or two thirds into the terrain penalties covered in the rule books. To handle these penalties and daily travel allowance on 8 mile hexes would be a disaster as we'd be dealing with a base movement rate of 1.8 hexes per day which is not very intuitive at all. The od &D movement rates works best with either 5 mile hexes at the largest scale or 1 mile hexes for more detailed wilderness maps so I'll be sticking to these. This will make travel easier in theory However, there is one thing that cannot be overlooked. The rules for food and water. The party have no water left. And in od &D, if incorporating the outdoor survival rules, the party progress on what is called the water index chart, which basically means each day they go without water, they move one place along the index and penalties are incurred on the beginning of day three, which become more severe as time goes by. Unless the party land on a water hex, they will either be forced to progress on the water index chart, or as an alternative, they can recover one step on the water index by remaining stationary for three turns on a water hex. There are officially no water hexes in Radleb Woods. Characters can also satisfy the current day's needs for water on a non-water hex by rolling a 1 or 2 after ending the current day's movement. However, there are further restrictions when a party become lost, so all is not as simple as it would first have appeared. So before I get into the actual gameplay for this episode, I'm just going to do a quick recap regarding the events of the wilderness adventure. Both parties are moving through Radleb Woods, trying to make it to Alabast. Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad are on their way from adventuring in the Palace of Evander and are trying to make it back to a safe place. Claudius, Alexander, Solana and Revere are making their way from Riflian towards Alabast in hopes of having a rendezvous with Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad. So they set out from Riflian on the 8th of Felmont and they camped at the northern edge of Radleb Woods about 20 miles west of Riflian and had a nighttime encounter with a young red dragon. Claudius kicked embers at the dragon and they managed to evade but ended up becoming lost. The next day Ilyena's party were moving south through Radleb Woods from the Palace of Evander towards Alabast. They had a daytime encounter with three werebores in human form and they managed to flee and were not pursued. Meanwhile, Claudius's party were moving northeast in the wrong direction after they became lost the night before. They emerged into a less densely wooded grassland where they could see the lights of Riflian directly east. 
so they recognized that they had become lost but at this point they had run out of food and were still several days journey away from Alabast. On the 10th day of Felmont, Ilyena's party were several hexes east of Korizeki Keep, still moving south towards Alabast, and they became lost and travelled southeast instead of south. They had a daytime encounter with the Hydra, Yolanda dropped three days of rations to distract the monster and they successfully evaded. Meanwhile, Claudius' party were unable to forage any food that day. They had a daytime encounter with two berserkers travelling through the woods who reacted aggressively. The party defeated them in combat and recovered enough food to last them for three days. On the 11th day of Felmont, Ilyena's party were continuing on the southeast trajectory, still going in the wrong direction, and they ended up coming out of Radleb Woods and entering a less dense grasslands that were still quite wooded, but not as densely wooded as Radleb. And they were just east of Alabast, and they could see the hamlet from where they were. So they began to journey towards it and encountered some elk grazing. And this brings us to the 12th day of Felmont. Ilyena's party were moving west towards Alabast, getting closer. They encountered the Hydra again, who had picked up their scent and came after them for more food. The monster was behaving friendly towards them. Cathbad gave it his rations. So it's currently night time on the 12th day of Felmont, and we are with Ilyena and Yolanda's party who are currently camped at the edge of Radleb Woods. The party are about to have a nighttime encounter near their campfire with six four-foot-long tiger beetles. The beetles move into a circle around the party and we go to initiative the party win the initiative the party will try to evade but because they were surprised they have a 10% chance and this is only because they are in a wooded area and with a 94 they fail to evade. As the party are unable to evade, they will be pursued by the tiger beetles. The pursuit will go northwest. There is a 50% chance that the tiger beetles will catch the party as they flee. and a 94 means that they do not. The pursuit will now continue southeast. The party can now attempt to evade again. There is three members in the party and there is over 60% of the possible number of tiger beetles. So that means that there is a 90% chance that the party can evade. Woods also add a further 25% chance to the evasion. So this means that in this instance, evasion is automatically successful. And because they have uh, moved two hexes, 
trying to evade these beetles, they will need to spend a full day at rest before they can continue their journey. During a full day at rest, two wandering monster checks will need to be thrown. So they will have an encounter on a 5 or 6 on the d6. So the first chance for an encounter is negative. But the second die indicates that there will be an encounter. So returning to Claudius's party, it's the 11th day of Felmont and Claudius's party are travelling through Radleb Woods. They are about 10 miles west of Riflian and hoping to rendezvous with Ilyana's party in Alabast. The party have a two in six chance of becoming lost. And with a five, they don't find themselves heading in the wrong direction. Claudius's party head southeast into the next woodland hex and this costs them two-thirds of their daily movement allowance. They are also only five miles northeast of Ilyana's party. According to the rules in Outdoor Survival, in the event a party's only movement would take them into a hex that would cost more movement than they have available for that turn, they are required to remain stationary until an alternate route becomes available or they recover sufficient life levels. So essentially, Claudius's party have come so close to meeting up with Ilyana's party who were only five miles ahead of them in the direction that they were heading, but they just do not have enough movement in them to be able to make it that far. So they will need to rest and are now subject to a wandering monster encounter. So on a five or six on the D6, they will have a random encounter. A two means that they do not. And the party now have an opportunity to satisfy their current day's water needs. So if they roll a one or two on the D6, then they are able to supply themselves with water. Unfortunately, they find no nearby streams or vegetation that they can extract water from. So they will be forced to advance on the water index. So as it stands, they are currently one day without water and they now have just two days of rations remaining. So we are now on the 12th day of Felmont. I've updated the position of Ilyana's party, who are now a further 10 miles west of Claudius's party. So unfortunately, Claudius was not able to catch up with them. Do Claudius's party become lost in the wilderness? They do not. So they move southeast and are now only 10 miles west of Alabast. Is there a chance that because they are moving through the same hex that Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad were moving through yesterday, is there a chance that they can pick up a track? So the most obvious way to handle this would be with an ability check. But the thing is, in od and chance of success is commonly boiled down to a X in six chance. 
So I map this to the ability scores as represented as low, average, and high scores. I split high scores into three categories, low, high, mid, high, and exceptional. So the way this works is if you have an ability score of 18, then you have a five in six chance of succeeding at a task that uses that ability score. If you have an ability score of 17, it is a four in six chance. 13 to 16 is a three in six chance. Nine to 12, two in six. And an ability score of three to eight means you just have a one in six chance. So the first time that an example of ability checks was ever given was in a article, Dragon Magazine, the very first issue in June of 1976. And it gave the following examples of uses for the individual ability scores. So for strength, any extraordinary physical exertion is applied to strength. Intelligence is discovering proper methods of operating mechanical devices, including magical devices, discerning patterns, deducing cause and effect, recognizing types of layers, learning new languages and skills, etc. Wisdom is divining the correct path of action, recognizing functions of devices, etc. Constitution is all questions of stamina, swimming, running, staying awake, going hungry, etc. Dexterity is manual manipulation of devices, balance, climbing, tying, untying knots, and so on. And charisma is believability, persuasiveness, morale of followers, and so on. So naturally, trying to pick up some tracks that have been left by Ilyana's party would be a matter of an ability check against wisdom. Claudius has a three in six chance of picking up these tracks. And on a roll of a three, he just about manages to do it. Claudius determines that these tracks are heading west towards Alabast, which essentially just reinforces his desire to go there. Unfortunately, the party have no movement left for the day. So the question is now, will they have an encounter with a wandering monster? And a five says, yes, they will. So I'm going to roll a d8 to find out what they encounter. Terrain type is woods. So a five is lycanthropes. So a d4 will tell us what type of lycanthropes the party will encounter. A three is were tigers. So I'm going to rule that because Claudius and party are following... Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad's tracks there is no possibility that they have walked into the lycanthropes lair there will be 2 to 20 of these were tigers so 12 altogether so here's the issue in woods were tigers double their melee capability and only magical weapons can harm them so the party have absolutely no chance let's roll for surprise so incredibly lucky with that one the were tigers are surprised so surprise by the party means that their evasion chances are doubled so their base chance starts at 50 they have a 25% bonus for being in woodlands. And if you double this, it takes the figure well over 100%. So evasion will be automatic. 
and this takes them to the end of the current day's travel. Can they fulfil their needs for water? And with a one, they can. And they now have one day of food remaining. So let's see what happens on the 13th day of Felmont. Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad want to move southwest so they can uh, make it to Alabast. Do they become lost? Yes, they do. So they will move in a random direction. And a three means they go southeast. And this will mean that they have a chance of bumping into Claudius's party. But you have to remember that each hex is five miles across. So there's only a chance that they will meet each other on the journey. So I'm going to leave it to the dice and say there's a two in six chance that the parties are going to cross paths. And a two means that they do. So the two parties become one party and they'd probably meet somewhere in the middle of the two hexes. But to keep things simple, I'm just going to make a roll to decide which hex they end up in. So they'll either meet five miles from Alabast or ten miles from Alabast. So they will meet five miles from Alabast, which is fantastic news. So the two parties have come together, Claudius, Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad are now reunited and situated five miles from Alabast. Claudius, Ilyana and Yolanda are delighted to see each other. They are overcome with emotion and spend time catching up on the events that befell at Castle Mistermere. They reminisce over their old friends Theodore and Elmo. Their fate is still a very sad story to tell and brings up the rage they all hold for Bargle the Infamous and the injustice they regard for the murder of Alina Halloran. But the question remains, is their reunion interrupted by a wandering monster? No, it's not. So the party are able to pool their resources. Neither has any water. And between them, they have enough food to last them for two days. Are they able to find water in the current hex? There is a two in six chance. No, they do not. So they advance on the water index, but luckily they are not thirsty enough yet to suffer any penalties. They share food and are now reduced to just one day's supply. So we move on to the 14th day of Felmont. And at this point they are very close to Alabast but will they become lost in Radleb Woods once again? The answer is no. Before the end of Solidain, the 14th day of Felmont, the characters roll into the small hamlet of Alabast. The brothers, Claudius and Alexander Tagaris, Close friends, Ilyana and Yolanda. Cathbad, the man who wishes to follow in the footsteps of the late Theodore Ivanos. And their two more recent companions, Solana of the Kalari Elves and Drevia of the High Forge Dwarves. They quickly find themselves in the Sleeping Tankard.
where Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad recount their tale to Tacklin Meriborn, whilst Claudius and his companions listen intently. Evandor built his palace on the edge of the enchanted forest as an act of revenge to keep Ara away from her people, they say. Tacklin is deeply taken aback by the story and moved to sadness by the eventual turn of events, but gladly gives the party the 30 gold pieces as promised. Yolanda notices a halfling sitting alone in the corner. It is the same widow they met in the palace, who was looting out of desperation. The woman looks to be drowning her sorrows. Yolanda gives her the 30 gold pieces. And this is where the adventure ends. For now. Now the adventure's out of the way. We can get into the juicy stuff now. Looking at the experience points that were awarded for the adventure. So I've completed a adventure record sheet, which is just a printed sheet that I use to record the events of the adventure, who took part in the adventure, the monsters that were defeated, the treasure that was found, and the experience points and the individual shares that each character will get. And obviously, at the start of this adventure, Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad were operating as a three. And later in the story, Claudius, Alexander, Solana and Revere came into it. But for the sake of simplicity, I filled out one adventure sheet for all the characters. However, when it comes to distributing the individual XP, this will be based on what the character actually took part in. So obviously the Blighted Vine, the Possessed Swords, the Possessed Armor, Rug, the Enchanted Chalice and the Giant Gecko, these were monsters that were defeated by Ilyana, Yolanda and Cathbad and Claudius and his friends had nothing to do with that so they won't be partaking in any of the XP from that they also won't be partaking in any of the XP from the treasure that came out of the palace of Evander but they will gain a little bit of XP for their fight with the berserkers in Radleb Woods. So if we look at what the party were actually able to obtain in terms of XP, they gained an incredible, <laughs> an incredible amount of experience points just from the monsters alone. They gained 300 and 35 XP, which is not to be snivelled at. But looking at the treasures found, they came out with 2,000 copper pieces, 1,000 silver pieces, 3,070 gold pieces, 12 moss gate gems worth a total of 120 gold pieces, one decorative unicorn horn worth 120 gold pieces, a jade worth 200 gold pieces, two pearls worth a thousand gold pieces, two carbuncles worth 2,000 gold pieces, a ruby worth 5,000 gold pieces, a star jacinth worth 20,000 gold pieces, a scroll of protection of undead worth 500 gold pieces, a scroll with a 1st, 2nd and 7th level spell worth 1,000 gold pieces, 3 crystal balls worth 15,000 gold pieces, and 2 healing potions 
worth 500 gold pieces. Now, they did come across other potions, but they made use of them in the adventure. Because these were not treasure that was found and kept, I won't award XP for them. And if you're wondering how I calculated the XP from the magic items in the three OD&D books, it doesn't really give any guidance on how to apply XP to magic items. However, in Strategic Review Magazine issue 2, and this was the predecessor to Dragon Magazine, and in issue 2 there was a article that gave a lot of extra info and advice regarding od d to kind of clear up some of the things that the book missed out or just glossed over. And this guidance meant that I was able to ascertain how XP should be awarded for magical items of their individual types. And this is something that I dealt with in my Castle of the Quest YouTube series in a little bit more detail. But altogether, the total XP from the treasure was 48,665, with a total XP from the adventure of 48,965. So this is a incredible amount of XP for an adventure that involved quite low-level characters. And the main reason why we've ended up with such a good haul is because the Dryad was holding treasure under her tree and the random rolls on the treasure types table brought about some really, really valuable items. So at this point, the characters are incredibly wealthy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This is, um, this is a lot of uh, in-game world value that has been obtained. But trying to manage resources on this level especially because it's cumbersome, is going to be a real challenge. So this will probably result in all kinds of emergent gameplay that will arise because the characters need to figure out what they're going to do with all this wealth. But at the moment, we'll focus on the XP, between Yolanda, Ilyena and Cathbad, they get a 16,311 XP share. Claudius, Alexander, Solana and Revere only get 7 XP each because all they did was defeat some berserkers, which were worth 30 XP in total. So their share is 7 because that reflects the small contribution that they made. Whereas the other three have managed to obtain a massive amount of XP. So here's the interesting thing. This XP will have to be capped. And that's because in od d Book 1, Men and Magic, it says that no more experience points should be awarded for any single adventure than will suffice to move the character upwards one level. Thus, a veteran first level gains what would ordinarily be 5,000 experience points. However, as this would move them upwards two levels, the referee should award only sufficient points to bring them to warrior, which is second level say 3,999 if the character began with zero experience points so if we apply that to the situation here Ilyana can only take enough XP 
to take her up to 4,999 XP because she will hit 4th level at 5,000 XP. So I've capped her so that she can only attain 3rd level and cannot then attain 3rd and 4th level in a single adventure. The same for Yolanda. I've had to cap her experience so that she cannot gain more than 4,799 XP because 4,800 would take her to 4th level. Kafbad, again, he's capped at 4,999 XP so that he doesn't attain 3rd level. So as it stands, Ilyana has now progressed from 2nd to 3rd level. Yolanda has progressed from 2nd to 3rd level. Kathbad has progressed to 2nd level. And everyone else is still at 1st level. And one of the perks for going up a level is the accumulation of more hit dice. And this actually led me to discover something that I'd previously overlooked in original Dungeons & Dragons. And that is that hit dice are rolled each time a character obtains a new level, but they do not roll hit dice on top of the hit dice they've already rolled. They roll all their hit dice from scratch to determine a complete new number of hit points. And what's led me to believe unanimously that this is the case is the following reasons. So firstly, if I read the text in Men and Magic under dice for accumulative hits, brackets, hit dice, this indicates the number of dice which are rolled in order to determine how many hit points a character can take. Pluses are merely the number of pips to add to the total of all dice rolled, not to each die. Thus, a superhero gets 8 dice plus 2. They are rolled and score 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. Totals 26 plus 2 equals 28. 28 being the number of points of damage the character could sustain before death. So the strange thing about this example, why would an 8th level fighter, aka a superhero, be rolling 8 hit dice instead of just 1 when they obtain 8th level? The argument could be he's just giving an example in the text. Uh, perhaps the character started at level 8, so rolled all their hit dice at the same time. But this is the problem. If you roll your hit dice at each level, then at first level, a fighter gets a plus one on their first hit dice. At fifth level, they get plus one. At seventh level, they get another plus one. So rolling eight hit dice plus two is not necessarily fair because it's unbalanced. It doesn't compare to someone who rolled a single hit die plus the bonuses at each level because they're missing out on the plus one at first level, the plus one at fifth level and the plus one at seventh level. And they're only getting, in the example, the plus two at eighth level. So this wouldn't make sense. One way that this could be reconciled is if hit dice were rolled before each adventure? Well, here's the issue with that. In Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, which is the third rule book, it has a section titled Healing Wounds, and this tells us that on the first day of complete rest, no hit points will be regained, but every other day thereafter, one hit point will be regained until the character is completely healed. This can take a long time. Here we have a direct example being given that between adventures, characters heal hit points. So the hit points that have been rolled on the hit dice must have relevance outside of 
the adventures that the characters go on. So there's only one obvious way I think that all this can be reconciled, and that is that each time a character attains a new level, they re-roll their hit points in accordance with the number of hit dice and the bonuses based on the level they've attained. So, for example, Ilyena, who is now a third level fighter or a swordmaster, to use the non-gender specific term rather than the original swordsman as it is in the text. She would roll three hit dice and that would determine how many hit points she has in total. Any previous hit points that she had are not taken into account at all. So there's a chance that she could roll less hit points than she had previously but it's slightly more likely that she won't than she will. Ilyena at second level had six hit points out of a possible 12. Let's see how she does at third level. In od d hit dice are always rolled on d6s. There were rules to vary the type of die used later in the Greyhawk supplement, but I'm playing using the first three books, and the only thing that I've brought in so far from Greyhawk is the Thief, so that I could convert Yolanda into a od d character. So, 3d6. So, 12 hit points altogether is not too bad. That's literally double what she had before. Kafbad gets 1 plus 1 hit points. So, 6 is not bad for a magic user at second level. And looking at the Greyhawk supplement now, I can see that... Gary introduced a amendment to the hit dice and hit point accumulation system. So as an alternative, he said that this system is expressly aimed at raising fighters and lowering magic users with regard to hit points, which can be sustained. This system functions as follows. For each level attained, the character gets one die for hit points until the top normal level is reached. Thereafter, a certain number of hit points will be added for each level above normal that is attained. So this is more representative of what we expect to see today in OSR clones and AD&D and um, the basic variations of D&D. But the original game played out of the box handled hit points differently. I'm going to stick to the original version of hit point accumulation. I've brought in the thief from Greyhawk, but I'm going to leave everything else that was brought in in that supplement where it is for the time being and get to know the game out of the box with the addition of the thief. And I will see as a thought experiment where this will take me ultimately. So at third level, the thief will get three hit die, no pluses, just basic 3d6. So let's see how many hit points Yolanda has at third level. 12, another successful roll, I think. So these characters have much more survivability at this point in the game. Yolanda also gets various ability increases to her special skills, opening locks, removing traps, pickpocketing, moving silently, hiding shadows, climb, and so on. And she also, at third level, can now read most languages. 80% of languages, so treasure maps can be read and understood by her without recourse to a spell. 
which may come in handy. And that's all I have time for in today's episode. The adventure, as I said, is over for now, at least as far as the Palace of Evander is concerned. But that's not all for this season of Tales of Mistara. The characters have a great amount of loot that they cannot afford to just keep lying around in plain sight. So in the next episode, we can look to address this. I hope to catch up with you then. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next session.